Might be better if I turn off the, the mute. <laughs> Welcome everybody to Raising Multilinguals Live. My name is Tetsu Young. Welcome everybody. I'm Rita Rosenbach from Multilingual Parenting. And I am Ute from Ute's International Lounge. Welcome everyone. And we are very honored to have a Dr. Karin Martin this evening as our guest. She is senior researcher and lecturer at the Carinthia University of Applied Sciences in Austria, as well as entrepreneurial linguist and consultant for multilingual education. Now, many people think that signs of dyslexia can only be detected once the children go to school as it impacts reading and spelling uh, abilities, but there are many more layers to it and uh, many more, uh, a great variety of aspects to consider, especially considering the variety of languages uh, or possible language combinations that we have in multilingual families. So I'm very honored to have you here as our guest, Karim, uh, to talk about multilingualism and dyslexia or dyslexia and multilingualism. So- Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I know that we could talk about this for hours as the, the topic is quite uh, vast and you have also written your PhD on this topic but could you maybe tell us in a nutshell let's say a coco nutshell <laughs> what <laughs> dyslexia is yes of course I will try Ute as you mentioned we could talk forever about this wonderful topic so Dyslexia is a term used to describe a severe difficulty that primarily affects the skills involved in accurate and fluid reading, word reading and spelling. Now, if you have a look in the internet, you will find many different definitions. And uh, since we don't have the time to go into details, I just want to mention two of them and maybe just to tell you a short story. So one definition that you can find in the internet is from the International Dyslexia Association. And this definition is very similar to the one by the European Dyslexia Association. They uh, define dyslexia as a specific learning disability or uh, as a disorder, specific learning disorder. So basically the idea that um, children with dyslexia, people with dyslexia have many difficulties in acquiring reading and spelling, and sometimes also difficulties with writing skills. And this is a kind of an ongoing challenge for people navigating in a world which is non-dyslexia friendly, right? So this is kind of a negative definition. So I want to show you, to tell you about a second definition, which is more positive that I personally prefer. The second definition is by the British Dyslexia Association. And in this case, you have uh, the following. Dyslexia is a neurological difference and can have significant educational implications. So basically for this, for the British Dyslexia Association, dyslexia is a learning difference. Again, it primarily affects reading and writing skills. However, it does not only affect these skills, also other skills that we're going to talk about later probably. But what I would like to stress, to underline here is uh, first of all that neurodiversity is a relatively new term. And uh, neurodiversity views these uh, difficulties, these differences, uh, not in terms of pathology, not in terms of something that is broken and that we need to fix or we need to cure. They are just the result of the normal variation that occurs in human genetics and development. So as you can see, is a completely different definition. It's more positive because it has to do with something that is just different, like me wearing glasses. I can't see without my glasses, so I'm different in this sense. It's kind of a, um, it's like a, the component of a person's identity, but it's not defining me, okay? It's not like, a, it's not something uh, that um, I have to cure, to, to fix. And um, the, what we need to do is to know, to be informed about this in order to find the best way to help 
children with dyslexia and building their reading skills and other learning um, learning skills. So just to give you an idea about how it feels to have um, a child with dyslexia or a person with dyslexia in your family, imagine, it, imagine you want to go on vacation and usually when you go on vacation, you decide on your destination based on what you want to visit, the climate you want to find, uh, you check the weather before you leave, you prepare your suitcase and so on. So there are some trips, however, where everything is not so easy to plan, right? So imagine you have your suitcase ready to go to the beach. And then when you get off the plane, you realize that you are in the mountains. So in a completely different place with cold weather and you don't have the right clothes. So you have to figure out where you ended up. You have to figure out how to uh, feel comfortable in this new unexpected situation. You Probably you have to buy some clothes or to find out exactly where you are, what's in this place. And, uh, you know, at the beginning, you feel like confused. You, you feel this disconfusion um, because you didn't expect to be in the mountains. But then once you realize, once you realize that and once you find what you need, you realize that being in the mountains is really nice. It offers many attractions. Maybe uh, you check and you see the snow and you see like a, a magical place. So even if uh, you were not prepared for that specific context, you learned in a short time to adapt and to find positive aspects, even in this um, unexpected situation, like I told you. So this is something that can happen also in real life, right? So. <laughs> One day uh, you realize that your child has some difficulties or maybe at school you are told that your child needs help. So first you think, maybe you think, yeah, well, maybe he's a bit lazy. Maybe she doesn't want to learn. And maybe you are a bit disappointed because you think, oh my gosh, my, my child doesn't want to study. But then you start to realize that there's something more there's something more you need to discover. So you try to know where to go, what to do, how to behave, how to behave where to find um, information about it. And sometimes you can even feel guilty uh, for not figuring out earlier what's going on. So you will meet people who will judge you, maybe. They will not understand you. But then you will also meet people who will listen to you they will advise you they want to help you in this most difficult moment so at this point uh, i think it's important to underline that you need the courage to ask for help so you don't want to be left alone uh, you can find this help by asking um, people and also being here in this uh, great event that my colleagues organized. So be proud of yourself that you are here and you are finding out more about dyslexia and multilingualism. Yeah. Yes, so there are many different things, but yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And also by indicating the, the point of view of parents who find themselves in an unexpected uh, situation, of course. And what I also find very inspiring is also seeing how the situation, if a child is dyslexic, how does the child perceive the world or how does the child perceive what is expected from him? And I, I came across a, a nice um, analogy. It's like when you, when you go for an obstacle run and you do not see the obstacles. And uh, dyslexic children, when they have to do certain tasks or to read, not only reading, and I, I'm going to ask you about this, it's like you, you never know what's in ahead of you, if you're going to stumble and fall or if you are just going <laughs> running, right? So uh, my next question is, uh, in fact, about we were saying that dyslexia can nowadays be detected very early on. 
uh, even before the children start uh, reading and writing at school. Can you tell us more about uh, this early detection of dyslexia, when this happens, or also what? how can we recognize the first signs of it, maybe also already in a, in a two or three year old? Yes, of course. Um, first of all, we need to always remember that dyslexia is not like a monolithic entity. So uh, dyslexia can have different forms and dyslexic children are not all the same. Okay, so having said that, uh, there is a, um, a complex of characteristics uh, that each person share more or less extensively. And some characteristics are um, identified as kind of risk factors. This is the term, this is how we usually call it. So risk factors uh, can be found, as you were saying, in preschool children. And then the characteristic of school children are then similar, but there's also more, of course. So um, keep in mind also that um, if you identify some of these risk factors, um, some characteristics are more common than others, and some children have them to a certain degree. And then, so it, it's quite complex, but still, it's important to consider that uh, the behaviors are chronic, okay? So it's not something uh, that um, comes and goes. So you should be able to identify some specific factors. So um, let, let's mention a few of them. Um, first of all, uh, the connection with memory, difficulty in memory, in remembering, sorry, information and instructions. Um, sometimes some difficulty, some problems in motor coordination, uh, but also difficulties learning numbers, uh, days of the week, colors, shapes. So all of these uh, things, especially when they are presented in sequence. Um, some difficulties in telling or retelling a story in a correct sequence. Um, some difficulties in following multiple directions and routines. So um, these children might appear a little bit kind of clumsy, uncoordinated, uh, especially in sport activities. And so there are some problems involving uh, motor skills. Uh, but then there are also um, difficulties recognizing the signs that make up a word. They might confuse them. Um, or um, difficulties, for example, in learning rhymes. You know, at the kindergarten, it's very important for the language development to play with the language, right? So they're, they're singing songs, they're... Uh, playing with the language, doing rhymes, and sometimes it's difficult for these children to maintain the rhythm. Um, what else? Uh, some, mm, yes, well, some difficulties with the discrimination of sounds. So they might be confused, they might uh, exchange sounds like or they might um, exchange something like, you know, when you want to say fish and chips, they might say chish and fips. That's called spoonerism. Mm -hmm. um, or incorrect sentences when speaking or replacing also sounds in some words. So, of course, if you're replacing sounds, you're changing the meanings of the word. Um, and slow, they are slow in expanding the vocabulary. And there is one, uh, another aspect that I want to mention, which is relevant in the context of multilingualism. Usually these kids are later talkers, so they start to talk later. And this is, we need to be very careful with this uh, risk factor because um, it's also very interesting. We know that some bilingual children might start speaking later. Of course, it depends. Are we comparing them with bilinguals or are we comparing them with monolinguals? So always be careful what you are comparing your child to. But anyway, even if they start talking later, they usually catch up. Right. So they once they start talking, um, they speak uh, step by step. They, they reach the, the level which is appropriate to their age. And then it's important to also consider um, 
the issue of being dominant language, less dominant language. So it's a bit complex, but I would say these uh, factors that I mentioned are the most common that you can identify in a child at the age, let's say three to five, so kindergarten age. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, I don't, I don't like, would you like me to mention some characteristic at an older age, uh, Uta, maybe? Yes. Because in that case, I mean, as I told you, every child is different. You need to observe if these uh, characteristics are persistent. And in that case, um, when they're starting to uh, learn how to read, you you might notice that reading is very difficult, it's very slow, it's very laborious. They have uh, some difficulties in uh, identifying rhyming words or counting syllables, if the language has syllables, and different with hearing and manipulating sounds uh, in words, also distinguish different sounds, um, or alert difficulties in learning the phonics, and um, poor reading comprehension is another thing, but I need to, we need to keep in mind that really com- poor reading comprehension is more the consequence. It's not, uh, I mean, it's a characteristic, but why can't they not uh, comprehend the text? Because they're struggling while reading, they're struggling in decoding the letters. So it's obvious that if you take so much energy, so much struggle in trying to identify, uh, to decoding the letter um, sound uh, mapping, then it's quite difficult to remember what you read. It's quite difficult to, to understand what you read. Other characteristic uh, can be found in writing. So uh, might be difficult for these children to put in idea to put ideas on paper spelling mistakes are quite common and um like i told you before difficulties in naming colors objects but also letters so some difficulties in learning the alphabet i um as we are talking about multilingual families and in multilingual families we have a a huge variety of uh, combinations of languages and you were mentioning the phonemic awareness, the, the, the possibility to put um, sounds and letters into relation, that they struggle with that. What is about uh, children who learn um, languages who don't require analysis of phonemes, like Japanese or Chinese? Or is it in a family, for example, where you have Mandarin and uh, Italian and English, yeah? And the child learns first maybe to recognize the signs in Chinese and then uh, English at school and maybe Italian as well. And and with English and Italian, we have also quite different languages, right, with uh, with this recognition of sounds. Um, Can you tell us more what what this would have as consequence? Yes, of course. Um, first of all, I need to tell you the the research and the work that I did at the University of Verona. We were con- we con- we were concentrated, focused on European languages, but I still had the chance to read some um, some studies from other colleagues. So I will show uh, what I know to the best of my knowledge. So, for example, there is a, the so-called differential dyslexia. So, is the case where a child, let's imagine. There was a, actually a very famous case um, of a study published in 1999 of a Japanese English bilingual child, and he was having difficulties in English but not in Japanese. Now, unfortunately, I do not speak Japanese, but maybe Tetsu can uh, make a comment about that. But apparently, according to that study, um, it was exactly what you were saying that in that case, Japanese uh, do not uh, require uh, high skill in phonetic uh, awareness or phonological awareness. So the ability to recognize and manipulate sounds. So this is what can happen. So basically it's the question, can a child be dyslexic in one language and not in the other? Well, the first answer 
would be no, actually no, because it's genetic, it's uh, neurological uh, and genetic, uh, so it runs in family, right? So actually it's supposed to uh, be um, a child with dyslexia will usually will show, should show a uh, manifestation of dyslexia in both languages. But um, the, as I said before, the environment can affect uh, the manifestation of dyslexia. So the child can um, have different manifestation of dyslexia depending on the language, depending on the writing system. And usually we distinguish between um, transparent language or transparent writing system and non-transparent writing system. Okay, so just make a quick example. A transparent writing system or a transparent language is a language where the mapping um, to sound, phoneme and grapheme and letters is one to one. Okay, so if we take Italian, it's a very transparent language. I say the word casa, there are sounds there, and I really read the letter, the sounds, not the letter actually, but I really uh, identify the letter with one sound. Okay, now imagine, um, let's take English. Okay, and we, we can think about this, um, this cluster O U G H and think about how many different ways you can pronounce this yeah. sound, you know, yeah. like though, through, tough, and, and many others. So in this case, the relationship, the mapping is not one-to-one, -one, it's one-to-many, mm -hmm. and it can be even more complex. It can be many-to-many. -many. So in this case, if we have an Italian English bilingual child, it's obvious that the child will have more difficulties in English than with Italian. But it's, it doesn't mean that English speaking um, people are more prone to have dyslexia. No, it's just the fact that the way the language, the orthography of the language is structured, cause to have more difficulties. It, it, you need just more time to learn all the possible combination. And, um, you know, there are different um, descriptions for that, but I was reading also about a very interesting way to classify languages depending on the morphology, okay? The morphology, how, how words are, are um, built. And basically, uh, there was a, a nice example of a Finnish language. Again, I don't speak Finnish, but I, know, I do. I do. <laughs> you do. Oh, there will be. So you, you can comment on that, Rita. And basically, according to this um, definition, they said, OK, Finnish is a quite transparent language because uh, similar to Italian, looks like you read what you uh, what you write. So it's, it's actually, really... it's, it's it's very transparent. Even the vowels, if there if it's a long vowel, you have two vowels. A short vowel is one vowel. So it's extremely transparent. Yes. And so because it's extremely transparent, you might expect, oh, yeah, that's easy. But then you need to check the morphology. And apparently, you will tell me, uh, Finnish has a quite complicated and opaque morphology. Mm -hmm. right? I don't know if you want to make an example. But basically, the idea is that, um, so basically, the advantage that you have with this transparency in the sound to letter mapping disappear when uh, morphology comes to place. So um, maybe to, I, I can give a quick example so so, so listeners understand what, what, what you mean with morphology. So in, in Finnish, you have a house, which is talo. And then you say in the house, it's talossa. You add SSA to the end. And then you say in my house, it's talossani. And then you say also in my house, it's talosanikin, and then you can ask also in my house, it's talosanikinko. So you're just building up the word. <laughs> so yes. Yeah. yeah, so the majority of the words are polysyllabic, so many little pieces coming together. They're very long, and uh, this might cause uh, some problems apparently. So it's really, um, it depends on the language. So basically the language can have a, an impact on the manifestation of dyslexia. 
Yes, and and I can imagine that the the difficulty with the Finnish language language uh, with all agglutinated languages, also Hungarian, is that they have children when they learn it, they have to memorize these words. It's in the memorization um, category, I think, of dyslexia or not, because you mentioned the different aspects of uh, that play a role in uh, the difficulty of being able to read and, and then also write, telling stories and uh, et cetera. Yes, uh, sometimes there's a difficulties in remembering things. So yeah. like if you tell a story and a dyslexic child might forget some part of it or maybe uh, change the order. Yeah. So yes, it's, it's quite complex. Also consider, consider how much time do children need to learn uh, in that case, Finnish or to learn English, to learn the, the spelling of English, right? Mm -hmm. It goes on um, until, I don't know, um, until middle school or, um, I mean, it can, it can take quite a lot of time, whereas a child with a more transparent language like Italian, but also Spanish, um, it's quite quick. So after the first year or maybe the second year, they're ready. They, they, they learned uh, all the combination of letter sound and they're ready to read. And this is also very interesting because um, sometimes um, some Italian, Italian speaking dyslexic children are not diagnosed, right? Because they're just slower maybe than the rest of the group. And so it's quite difficult to detect these issues. But of course, as I told you, there are other characteristics and usually uh, that's why you really need to, to, to do a test to find out more about the family and all the possible information in order to put together a profile of the child. That's very important. So, so thinking of multilingual families and bilingual multilingual children, so should parents take this into account and, for example, um, try to allow the child to learn in the language which is considered easier for someone with a di di dyslexia difference. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Yes, Rita, it's a very uh, important question. Let me tell you that uh, when I first started working on dyslexia, my original idea, the first idea was to, um, to study monolingual children learning a foreign language okay so i was testing italian kids learning english italian kids with dyslexia learning english so i started to investigate that and yes in that case the recommendation if you can and if it's possible in your child's school the recommendation would be yeah well then let's study an easier language right so in that case i would tell an italian family yeah let's study Spanish instead of English. But of course, English is compulsory, so it's not really always possible. But that is one part of the story. When we are talking about multilingual children, we need to consider uh, if the language, what are these languages? Are languages of the family? Are languages of the community? When did they have the first contact with the language? How much input do they get? So um, imagine, um, that the most difficult language is the family language. I, I would like to think twice, uh, you know, uh, before deciding, before taking the decision of uh, not teaching to read and write in that language, because there are many other factors involved here, also the social and emotional factors. But yes, uh, you know, if it's possible, I will go to the easier language. But what you can do, of course, is to focus on the oral language, the conversational <laughs> and emotional uh, part of the of language learning. So there are two different aspects. On one side, monolingual children learning a foreign or a second language, and then bilingual children growing up with different languages. And of course, the two uh, the two fields are you know, there's a little overlap there. There's some, some things are mixed together. So yes, it's really a very personal family choice. 
Yeah, and uh, I have a question about this because when we think about uh, young children, it's often said, well, uh, the earlier the better, right? The exposure to a, a broader variety of phonemes coming from different languages and making sense of them, uh, the better. So the earlier the better. Um, wouldn't this also be the case for dyslexic children uh, as the combination of more complex phonemes or yes let's say then words and and in different languages let's yeah take the language english that is not so transparent it's rather opaque uh, wouldn't it make sense then to actually start quite early on with exposing them at least to a, a greater variety of different combinations as uh, with passing, yeah, becoming older, it might be more difficult for them to, to recognize and to distinguish between them, or am I mistaken? No, I totally agree with what you're saying, Uta. Uh, first of all, because as we know, uh, bilingualism and multilingualism can have uh, bring, uh, let's say, brings many advantages and not only related to language, but also related to other aspects that have nothing to do with the language. So like a problem solved, yeah, many other things, yeah. many other uh, also cognitive advantages. What you are talking about, about is uh, kind of, is the topic, the issue of this uh, protective factor, right? So you're asking mm -hmm. uh, if there's kind of a um, benefit or advantage. And um, uh, there's a lot of discussion about that, but uh, yes, uh, I think for sure uh, to be exposed to uh, um, different um, sounds of different languages and so uh, different inven inventory of sounds um, help you, helps you to, um, to have a richer inventory, you know, so like mixing two or mm -hmm. more different um, group or groups of sounds, let's say, uh, let's call it like that. So it will, it might help you in the ability to recognize them or maybe manipulate them and also understand it. It might help you to understand the difference uh, between sounds, between languages. So, um, I mean, yeah. I, I don't have a, 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 I can't mention a study or research yes, about no. that, but I, I really believe that it might be um, a positive thing and attention. I, I, I really um, would like to, to recommend to, um, to expose mm -hmm. children from early on. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. right. yes. Um, can I ask another question? I was thinking about uh, education. In most countries, it's still very much literacy based. So you read about things and you write about things. And uh, thinking that uh, children with dyslexia, that they have the disadvantage that the tool that is used for learning is the tool that they struggle with. And um, um, so I'm just thinking, could parents maybe emphasize more that they, when they, let's say, the learning about the world, geography, history, whatever, that they could use more visual input or maybe listen to some programs. So it wouldn't always have to be to read from a book. Yes, of course. So basically, depending on the country, uh, there are different um, tools to support these children. So the first thing that I would do, uh, that I would recommend uh, to a parent is to check if there's a dyslexia association or um, somebody at school, for example, a referent, a person responsible for learning difficulties and ask them because it depends on the country. But let me give you an example um, in, in it from Italy where I come from, where I work with dyslexic children. So uh, once you have a diagnosis after the second uh, school of, um, after the second year of the primary school, you have access to this um, supporting uh, tool, supporting um, material and so on. And one of them is to have, yes, the possibility to have visual uh, support when studying, for example, like you mentioned, geography or history or this kind of subject, but also the possibility to use to record the lesson, for example, and to listen to it at home. Uh, but also if 
children are also struggling uh, with maths or with, uh, you know, I told you before, a sequence of uh, names of uh, objects, they can have um, this list uh, with them when they're studying and sometimes also during exams. Like I told you, it depends on the uh, on the law, on the regulation of the specific country. But yes, there are many different things that you can do, and one of them is to have this uh, visual support. Um, you know, usually uh, children with dyslexia are very creative and they're very good in seeing the, the big picture, right? Mm -hmm. So as I was saying in the beginning, even if every dyslexic child is different, still, um, it's really up to you, to the family, to the parents, to find out what are the strengths mm -hmm. of your child and use them and focus, the strength, focus on the strengths um, instead of focusing on the weaknesses, okay? Of course, at the beginning, it's, it's quite hard work because you don't know how it works, but uh, you can uh, collaborate with the teachers and I recommend to talk uh, to the teacher quite often to tell them how your child works, how your child studies, okay? So if you notice at home, hey, my child uh, is doing very well with having some images, uh, you know, and to put them in order to, to tell the story that he cannot uh, remember, then tell the teacher. So we identify that working with visual, with figures, uh, with image is helping my child really really a lot. So would you mind to um, introduce this kind of strategy also during the lesson? It's really, uh, you know, it's a teamwork. It's mm -hmm. a teamwork with the goal of helping uh, the child to feel secure, feel comfortable and feel, um, you know, not like something that is broken, as I told you, need to be fixed, but something that is just different. So I just need to find out what is my magic formula and then go for it. <laughs> yes, and I think it's very important also what you say, uh, the collaboration between teachers and parents, but also to know as a parent, okay, in the school where my child is going, there is maybe one teacher who has been trained on how to work with dyslexic children and to bring that teacher in. And also as a parent have some kind of trainings because there are trainings for parents with dyslexic children. Because uh, what I saw with my clients and with some friends who have dyslexic children with different kind of uh, yeah, problems of uh, uh, studying and memorizing, etc., is that at the beginning when you're there, like you said at the beginning, uh, when we started this uh, broadcast, you, you seem like not understanding where you're going to to head to yeah what what can you do what is possible uh how can i help my child because very often the child is uh, pretty young when when you you get this kind of uh, diagnosis or and finding out what helps your child can take years oh, yeah. so instead of uh waiting to f find it out yourself on your own at home with the frustration the guilt and everything that comes on the plate when you have to do with a child in that situation, but what, as you said, it's not something that is negative. It's only negative if we don't know how to help them. And if we know that there are groups and that there is something that we as parents can learn, uh, it can help us a lot to have this learning experience as parent much shorter, right? So. Absolutely. I yes, just that wonder. would be my tip number one. Oh, okay, <laughs> yes. So, yeah, yeah I, I like to call it um, education, the educational level. Educate yourself okay. um, about about dif dyslexia, about learning difficulties, read books, go to lectures, talk to mm -hmm. professionals, ask questions, and uh, download all the resources available under Dyslexia Association and read them right mm -hmm. but also as you were saying to connect with people vitamin c vitamin yeah. connect right <laughs> so really to um to make sure that you're talking about it so that you do not feel alone that's also very important and you know what it's also very important to talk about it with your child it's very important to explain mm -hmm. what dyslexia is um to have 
this positive attitude attitude um there's a there's an, um, a funny way to do it i found it in one of these uh, dyslexia association i guess it was italian one i can't remember but anyway they call it the so-called elevator pitch right so the elevator okay. pitch is this uh, small um you know, a couple of sentences that you might say uh, why you are uh, in the elevator when you want to explain to somebody what you're doing in your life, who are you, right? And so they find this nice way to, um, to help children talk about dyslexia. And they said, so uh, try to find your elevator pitch with your family, which could be, might be something like, like, like this for children. Hey, I have a dyslexia. This means my brain is wired differently than your brain, but different is okay. So I'm not lazy. I'm not dumb. I just work uh, in a different way. It takes me longer time to read, but that's okay. So please be patient with me. And um, remember that I am very creative. I use my creativity to find other ways of doing things. You know, yeah. something like that makes uh, feel them comfortable. Yeah. Because as we said, I, I will never be tired of repeating this. It's not a disease. It's not something that you take your pill and it disappears. No, it's a mm -hmm. long life condition. It's just a, a different way of, of navigating yeah. life. So the, the emotional level is very important. This is what we're talking about as well. Yeah, that's very, very, very nice. It reminds me, I once held a talk at school to 13-year-old children. It was about life skills and resilience. And uh, I came into the classroom beforehand to have a chat with them and to see where they are. And uh, there was a boy who came to me and he said, OK, are you going to use slides? And I said, yes, I'm going to use slides. And then he said, well, uh, you know, are you writing a lot of words? Because I'm dyslexic. Uh, and how can I then follow? I don't want to, yeah ask you all the time and i found it so great that he could stand up he came to me not in front of the whole class this is not necessary but uh since then i use a lot of visuals actually more visuals than text and uh it helped me also to understand how to help him and he nicely explained to me if you put there a picture and i can associate it with what you're saying it helps me much more because i cannot read the text as quickly as the others so slowing down you know the the different slides or or also what you are telling them to repeat it in different contexts and from different angles that helps a lot and i think uh, this raising this awareness among teachers among everyone who has to do with people around the world because there are so many dyslexic people and i i know karin that you you might have a list of uh, famous dyslexic uh, people somewhere or we wanted to talk about that which in my opinion is also something uh, encouraging if you have a class in front of you and there are maybe two dyslexic children to know you're not alone and actually there is actor so and so actress so and so politician and very bright people who are dyslexic yes, as well yes Yes, I just uh, made some notes because actually there's yes. so many and there are also some Nobel Prizes. So go yes. and check it. Who is the Nobel yeah. Prize in dyslexia? Yeah. But maybe to mention some actors, Tom Cruise, Kira Knightley, or, you know, Jamie Oliver, this British <laughs> cooker. I, I love the way he talks and he, he, he talks and he cooks. Um, another actor, uh, actress, Jennifer Aniston. But also many entrepreneurs, many business people. And I mentioned, I like to mention Steve Jobs. So, you know, just to connect again uh, with this. I'm having a meeting. Sorry. I'm really sorry. That was the Don't worry. cleaning lady wanted to clean my office. So apparently it's too late in Austria to be in the office. Sorry for that. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, I was saying with this idea of creativity, so, you know, another tip that I would like to give to parents is that school is not everything and you can learn in many different things. Think about going to a museum, going to an exhibition, um, taking pictures and, and talk about what, what you saw, what you did during the day. There are many, uh, many ways you can really um, learn many things and, and improve uh, your skills 
even not necessarily with reading and writing. Although, of course, reading is important. It doesn't mean that you stop, that you should stop reading. No, mm -hmm. you should read and exercise and uh, do, uh, you should do probably this, how is it called, this pair reading, mm -hmm. you know, uh, when you're sitting with your child, not longer than 50 minutes, because it's, you know, it's quite... Uh, time consuming is it's um, it's quite tiring, but you can read. So sorry, them, what did you talk say? about it? And did you say uh, fifteen or fifty one five 15, or five one five one five? One yes. five. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Very yeah. short. Yeah, because the idea is that you want to help your child to expand her or his vocabulary, right? So it's it's not only about reading, it's also about talking and learning new words. So you might ask a question about what you read. You might ask, so how is the story going to end? What are your thoughts? Uh, which was your favorite uh, characters uh, in, in the story? So mm -hmm. it's really the different ways to, yes, to yes. bypass. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank yeah. Um may yeah, please Rita. Yes, uh, I, I just want, want to say another famous person who is dyslexic is the King of Sweden, who is, who is very open about his dyslexia. Uh, we have some questions yeah. from, from the audience. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we have um, one from Abu. Uh, let me just put it down. So he's British Bangladeshi and received special English classes in secondary school and it helped him to become an avid reader. Uh, but he's struggling to read Bangla and Arabic. There's a follow-up question from me as well. Will I struggle to learn an additional language? Yes. Um, I mean, I, I, I do not speak Bangla and Arabic, unfortunately, but I can only imagine the struggle. I guess uh, these are like second languages for you, foreign languages. I don't know if you uh grew up with bangla probably but then you learn arabic later so yeah i would say it's normal to have these difficulties um hmm, what to do i would practice i wouldn't uh, give up i cannot give you a specific advice uh, about this um i would only practice i don't know if you colleagues uh, would like to add mm. anything um, so what, what I have uh, read is that if uh, the languages that you are learning, is, uh, it depends also the, the amount of time that you have, right? If we are talking about five years, 10 years, 20 years, and when you need to read certain uh, language goals. Um, but if the languages are very different from each other, you have one language from left to right, one from right to left, and then maybe you have Chinese or Mandarin. Uh, there are different kind of aspects that need to be considered, and that takes more energy, yes, mm -hmm. and more memory space and more time to, to really get into it and to, to learn it, to acquire it or learn it to the extent that is uh, required at school or in the communities of society to read the signs and yes, to fill in a form. Yes, all, all these things. But um, this is the only thing that comes to mind uh, at that moment, <laughs> at this moment. Yeah, yeah. and then um, just Abba had, had the follow up question, uh, will he struggle to learn an additional language? I mean, this uh, dyslexia doesn't affect the language learning. You can learn additional languages as, as the oral we are speaking about the oral language so yeah i i would focus on the oral and conversational um learning part of the learning and also consider that we live in a time where we have so many resources uh, in the internet uh, so you can also um, check for games to learn the language so there are so many resources that you can use um and of course, it might be difficult because of these uh, working memory difficulties, no? the mm -hmm. difficulties of uh, keeping this new information that are learning, that you're learning. So yes, it might be difficult, but it's not impossible. Okay, yeah. so I, I still want to give a positive message because let me tell you this, maybe I just tell you briefly this story, which really, uh, it's really in my heart. So when I uh, met, um, the first time I met a dyslexic child, and he's the reason why I, I came to this fascinating word, 
I met with uh, the director of the school where he was going and uh, we were deciding when uh, would I have time to come and see him to do some training, right? So because I was working as this lecture tutor and the director said, you can come during the English class because he's not going to learn English anyway. And this hit me mm. so deep, so deep that I promised myself, okay, this is what you think. I'll prove you wrong. Okay. So now it's like eight years later, nine, I don't know. This child is attending an English speaking school. Okay. Mm -hmm. So please don't tell me that you are not, you cannot learn a foreign language. You can, it's more yeah. difficult. Yes, but it's not impossible. No, I, I think we all know uh, enough people who have dyslexia and who are multilinguals. So I think they, they prove this, uh, this person very, very wrong. But I can understand that uh, if, if you have difficulty in hearing sounds or connecting sounds with letters, etc., it will require more, more work. But uh, with aging and with uh, having more experience on how to approach them, Mm -hmm. uh, or this difficulty, I think you can, you, you learn how to deal with this. And once you've learned it with, uh, let's say with Italian, then it's easier with Spanish, for example. Yeah, using now a more transparent language. But I think we have another question from Trish yeah. van Putten. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, is dyslexia ever a reason not to pass on the home language? Some families I know use only the school language English with their dyslexic children who now can't speak their European home languages. Despite our constant reassurance otherwise, they feel it is too much for them. Trish is uh, a teacher in an international school in the, the Hague area. Yeah. No, there's no reason to give up the home language. Please do not do it. Always keep in mind that the home language or family language, whatever you want to call it, is connected to the social and emotional development of your child. OK, so please do not give up on that language. If you want to concentrate on the school language in terms of reading and writing, in terms of having the resources that your child need, well, yes, probably, um, I mean, if it's an international school, the, the, the school language is English, so you might have more resources to help your child in English instead of the other language. But there's no connection, you know, um, bilingualism is not the cause of the difficulties. It's nothing to do with this. It's not bilingualism, multilingualism, or speaking more than one language doesn't cause dyslexia, doesn't cause difficulties. We need to we need we really we really need to misspell this uh prejudice yes. this myth that i keep on hearing and mm. you're not alone trisha and and this family are not alone i i listen to very often i i hear people and family asking this question also because maybe they receive this kind of recommendation at school or even mm. from speech therapists right so you know it's very important to be informed about this and to be um, educated and to be, um, how do you say that, to be professionally um, prepared to work for dyslexia, with dyslexia and multilingual children, okay? So whenever you have this kind of doubt, you know, you're asking yourself, should I really drop up the home language? No, don't stop for a minute, think about it, because it's not a good idea and try to ask somebody else. If you don't know what to do, then try and go some and, and check for other information, but always make sure that the people who are giving, who's giving you this information is well trained for working with um, multilingual dyslexic children or multilingual children or dyslexic children. Always check for uh, the professional. Background. Yes, and here I have a question because I can imagine that one of the reasons why my parents would choose not to or would give up uh, is the frustration is the fact that you are um, alone on this journey and you have not the support that you need. So if you get the support in the school language but you don't get the support in your family languages, what are these families supposed to do? Yeah, if they know that my child uh, is going, if I know that my child is going to have support in school, in the classes with a teacher, with someone who helps them there, 
but I don't know how to do this at home. Or maybe the child is also tired, yes? Uh, when they are at home and they have to do the homework and it takes more time to do the homework in the other language, uh, how can I then make sure that we maintain our home languages and maybe at some point my child will also read maybe in the home language. So what would you yeah. suggest to these uh, yeah. parents? Yeah, um, that's a very personal choice. I think it's a very personal choice of the family if you want to um, to invest time and energy, not only for you, but also for your child. Because as you said, when children comes, uh, come home after school and they're tired, you don't want to sit on, on the desk and, and teach them, you know, and, and be um, their teacher. Remember that they, they will have so many teachers in life, but they only have one mother and one father. So I personally think that the relationship, the emotional relationship with the parents, with mother and father, is much more important than having good grades at school. So yes, it's difficult to support also the home language. If you can't, then just leave it. Then try to support the oral language to keep the contact with the family, with the relatives who are abroad, and try to concentrate more on the social, emotional aspect. And yeah, maybe your child will be able to learn um, to read in the home language later once he has, uh, you know, the, the, the structure, the, the support, when he, once he learned how to overcome some of the difficulties, and maybe he will try later. But really i wouldn't you know it's very um a very delicate um topic that uh, I, there is no magic formula for everyone you really need to check the specific case but i repeat uh, the social emotional component and aspect uh, is much more important than that uh, having good good grades at school that's my personal mm. thought yeah Thank you. So I don't see any any further questions. So I would like to to close maybe on a high note, as you said, uh, you you were already mentioning it before. So you were mentioning uh, certain aspects like uh, dyslexic children or people who have dyslexia have actually um, high analytical skills. They are quite creative. Um, they can think outside of the box. Um, they learn from very early on to, to work hard, yeah, and uh, are good in problem solving. This is my experience with uh, dyslexic uh, children and friends that I have. It's amazing. <laughs> they are my to-go-to -to people <laughs> when uh, there are problems. So I think when we emphasize these aspects, um, not only now for, to, for concluding this, uh, this session, but uh, with parents who are maybe at the beginning of this journey and are a little bit scared. I mean, as parents, you are always scared if anything unexpected happens, but it gives you uh, a great hope and it's not something that is uh, impossible and we, we know this. Um, would you like to add some, some tips that you would give to our followers? Um, well, yes, maybe we can summarize. The first uh, thing that I told you before was the educational aspect, okay? So educate yourself, uh, check information, read books, talk to people, use the vitamin C to connect with other people and talk to your child, uh, which is also at the emotional level. On the practical level, you can you want to help your child to be more organized, right? So always consider um, routines or always to do the homework in the same place, uh, explaining what needs to be done um, and everything. And, and the final thing I mentioned already uh, before is to provide alternative learning opportunities. As I told you, they're creative. So uh, let's go to a museum, to a gallery or to an exhibition and let's talk about what we are saying. And um, or maybe educational television programs. That's another way uh, to learn. Right. And also try to discuss with them, with your children, to discuss, but in a very informal way to about what they learn, about what they um, 
yes, what, what they heard, what they learned. And maybe just to close, I would like to mention one thing uh, that I told you before, Lernen mit Pferden. So it's a center, it's called uh, Learning with the Horses, and I'm collaborating with them. I've been collaborating for some years with them. So basically, it is a center here in Austria, and it's spreading also in other countries, in Germany, Switzerland, Luxembourg, if I'm not wrong. And they help children with dyslexia by uh, working with horses. So they are in the nature. They are, of course, we don't have the time to go into details, but basically they are very specific uh, horses, uh, very intelligent animals, who, uh, which, or oh, yeah, who, <laughs> they're like people to me. Uh, they can help children with dyslexia feeling more secure, feeling self-confident, okay? And what I... Men, what I would like to say is that there are also learning opportunities outside in nature. So you just have to look around and find uh, and find you uh, these opportunities. So yes, I, I guess it's a message of hope. A positive yes, message. Yeah. absolutely. Yes, um, I know that this might sound like a like a negative ending, but we have one last question from Yulia Zalpina. And she's asking, can children grow out of dyslexia? You mean if dyslexia disappears? Probably. Uh, so dyslexia is a long-term condition. So it doesn't disappear because it's not a disease. It, it's not some, it's a difference, okay? It's mm -hmm. not something that you can cure. Or no. But what you can do is to learn how to uh, manage, how to, um, how to do things having dyslexia. So, of course, uh, like we said, there's so many uh, great famous people and not famous, right? So also Nobel Prizes. You can overcome these difficulties. It just takes yeah. some time. So yes. it's not it's not a disease. So get rid of this idea of yes. having dyslexia disappearing. It doesn't disappear because yeah. it's not a disease. It's and I, I, and I, I would even go that far to say that some of these people, uh, Nobel Prize winners, have because of their dyslexia, yes. they have had to look for different ways of thinking. They have uh, looked for different solutions that nobody else has thought of before because they can just go on as, as normal. But this, uh, in, in I think in many cases, it could have been a gift that, mm -hmm. that yes, specific agree, person yeah. with those skills yeah. had dyslexia because otherwise they wouldn't have looked yeah. for the other way, the better way of doing things. I love that. Rita. Absolutely. Wonderful. Yes, totally <laughs> agree with you. Yes. I think we, we should uh, end, end on a high note. <laughs> yes. <laughs> indeed, it was a very, very high note indeed. I don't know if, if anybody noticed, I, I did not speak one word no. in this whole <laughs> <No>. hour. <laughs> there, were, there were times where I unmuted and, and tried to come in, but then, I, and then but the, the flow was just right in there and didn't want to break the groove. <laughs> but, Extremely sorry, fascinating. Learned so, learned so many <laughs> things again, and I I think what I really got from uh, from this whole discussion is we were really able to disengage or sort of separate the the literacy part, which is what the the, the traditional I think the dyslexia with are concerned with, from the emotional and the oral the communication part of language, which I think is a is a great way to really approach this. Uh, the situation so so thank you for that uh, lots of solutions uh, i think that we were able to provide to uh, our our listeners uh which we would like to thank again everybody who's tuned in on both youtube and on facebook thank you for your great discussions comments and uh, questions past the hour already i can't believe it <laughs> it's just it's coming back so fast yeah. so uh are we ready to look forward to the next session we are already yeah. in the you, last Karen. thank you karen thank, thank you, you very karen. much <laughs> thank you so much karen so let me let me set up the uh the next discussion and put it on the screen there you go
Yes, and we are very honored to announce our next guest is uh, Dr. Sabine Little. She's lecturer at, in languages education at the University of Sheffield in the UK. And on Tuesday, 15th of June, she will share with us how children and parents collaborate in home language maintenance. So she's going to talk about children and parents collaborating in home language maintenance on Tuesday, the 15th of June at 1 p.m. New York, 6 p.m. London and 7 p.m. Paris. Fantastic. Thank you, Uta. And I see uh, Karen taking a, a sip of water finally. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I did think every once in a while I should come in and, and give you some time to, to take a drink. But uh, once again, thank you for your insights. It's yeah. been uh, tremendous. It's amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was a pleasure. And I really, really appreciate the work you're doing. As I told you before, this is so valuable and so inspiring, you are bridging the gap between the research world thank and you. the real world, let's say. So thank you for this amazing work. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And you uh, keep it up so that we have we have something to bridge. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Building bridges. Yeah, absolutely. Building bridges. We do. Okay. okay Bye, Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Tschüss, auf Wiedersehen. Hey, hey. Alla prossima.